All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Camille Santana Considine, and I'm thrilled to be this year's coordinator for Lunch Poems. And it's a pleasure to welcome Sherwin Bitsui for the first reading of the year. Um, this reading has also been organized in partnership with the Arts Research Center. And so as part of that collaboration, Bitsui will also be giving a craft talk entitled Drawing Language from Landscape and Immersion in Dine Poetic Thought and Structure. Then that'll be right after the reading at two here. Um, we've also collaborated with the Codex uh, Foundation Logan Book Arts Center. So we have Jonathan Gherkin and they brought broadsides that are in the back. The foundation is directed by Ing Bruggerman um, and they've created a handset letterpress printed broadside on three different papers, um, which you can pick up over there. And then there are some in the case that you can check out. We also have Pegasus Books via Patrick selling some of Sherwin's books, which you can buy either right after the reading or after the craft talk, and then they'll be available to be signed. Um, and I also wanna thank everyone who makes Lunch Poems possible. Dr. and Mrs. Tom Colby, the library, particularly Amber and the student workers, the English department and the Dean's office. Um, the director of Lunch Poems is Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who is unfortunately unable to be here today. So I'll be reading the introduction he's prepared for Sherwin and then Sherwin will read. In Sherwin Bitsui's Dissolve, we constantly encounter a kind of syntactic melt in which brief metaphors morph into other equally brief metaphors. The language of the poems goes on by dissolving one description into another, nested figures making land and being and technology and the urban and settler colonial and indigenous histories inextricable. The elegant jarring of this constant refiguration is the beautiful, fierce, sorrowful outcome of ugly history, a series of alterations that remake the landscape as poetry while showing how constructed and precarious, how transient such remaking is. The volume is suffused with the continuous action of the past on the present, quote, no language but its rind crackling in the past tense, or quote, every link in the trail to here is a bullet's path to back there. An exquisitely complicated version of this documentation of living history reads, quote, and for a second, the flattened field is chandeliered by desert animal constellations, end quote. Here, a field is taken for agribusiness or lying fallow with no one to work it becomes for a second re-enchanted and illuminated by the mythic projections of land onto sky. But even here, the idiosyncratic choice of chandelier turns the field into an indoor space of privilege and wealth, such that this brief moment of reseeing carries everything that would damage hope or nostalgia with its flicker of optimism. But Zui doesn't write simple laments or fierce celebrations. He melds such basic and isolated urges into an ongoing account of what has happened and is when, quote, an elegy hands me a busy signal. There's no time to wait and the language must move by shifting figure, by brief occupation of page through its harrowing account. The book's eponymous second section, Dissolve, is either a series of short poems or one long poem made up of dissolving units. This refusal to fix the identity and duration of the writing is another feature of Bitsui's transfiguring vision that will, quote, replace what I saw with what I heard. And these transformations extend beyond representing the scene and heard down into the very grammar of English, where nouns are often asked to do the words of verbs, a nod to Dine Bazad's preference for verbs over nouns, mountains, quote, mountain, and shadows, quote, obsidian dissolving one part of speech into another, enacting the liquidations and commingling and incursion Bitsui sees happening in language and culture. Dine Bazad haunts this English by contributing to it, a counter incursion and mounting its worldview and world pictures within the colonizer's vocabularies. Once all of these forms dissolve and conjecture have happened enough times, even straightforward representation feels like Bitsui's method in action. The line, quote, rising out of the uranium pond seems like a lyrical transformation of the mundane where uranium captures something of the water's dark and scintillating surface. But unfortunately, it's all too real. 
As an example, Redwater Pond Road Community is a Diné settlement in New Mexico located among three abandoned Cold War-era uranium mine and mill waste sites. Mitsui here takes his surreal transformation of landscape back towards unmediated description of the poisoning of Diné land and lives. Both modes, transfiguration and witness, work towards the same non-end, loosening the hold that conventional representation has on person, land, and language, dissolving those bonds so that other forms of attachment might be thinkable. Please join me in welcoming Sherwin Bitsui. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Jeffrey and Camille. <laughs> Uh, also, thank you so much for uh, to the organizers who brought me here, and um, yeah, it's just a, been a dream of mine to read here, um, you know, for for years and years, and it's finally good to be here. Uh, I'll introduce oh some more people over here. <laughs> uh, greetings, Yate, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, introduce myself, um, sort of how, how, just how we introduce ourselves, and Yate she Shuram Bitsui and Shia. Being put to me, to the chin in the shla. Tazatlana Bashes chin, Kiani does a chaydo, my dish gives me eight ashinala with I the Nanshla. A lay a the Natrate Nasha Ade, she hot at Doka, Kade, Behens, and Joe Ade, Hakosha don't need the sad bedest. My name is Sherman Bitsui, and I'm born for the um, Deer Springs Bitterwater people. And I am my my father's clan is the many goats people, and my uh, maternal grandparents are the towering house people, and my uh, paternal grandparents are the coyote pass people, and that's who I am in this world. Um, you know, no, and uh, all of those are my lineages, and all of those are uh, lineages, um, you know, of mother from mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers and so on. Since we're a matrilineal society. We inherit our mother's clan. So I am my mother's clan. <clears throat> yeah, it's really moist here too. I come from the desert. <laughs> so water just like <laughs> just comes at me. I start wearing it. And I'm a water clan too, so. Okay. So speaking of water, I'll read from a I'll read a poem that I that is in Flood Song. And it's a Navajo word poem. Uh, and see who knows what this word is. Toi. 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 It's the word um, for water, Navajo. Um, and it's in the flood song, and it sort of drips down the page um, seven times. <clears throat> and here's a poem from I'll Read Dissolve now. And um, this is my last book. Um, the opening poem is uh, called The Caravan, and it's kind of an Albuquerque poem, um, kind of my gateway into narrative poems. I've never really written narrative poems before, um, but this one sort of opened up that direction in my new work as well. The caravan. The city's neon embers stripe the asphalt's blank page where the story pens itself nightly, where ghosts weave their oily hair into his belt of ice, dress him in pleated shadows and, and wait, sorry. Dress him in pleated shadows and lay him fetal on the icy concrete, the afterbirth of sirens listening over him. We drain our headlights on his scraped forehead and watch the December moon to step across his waxen eyes, his mouth shallow pond, a reflecting pool where his sobs leak into my collar. One more, just one more, he whispers, as he thaws back into the shape of Nihitzele, our brother. 
bruised knees thorning against his chest. We steal away, our wheels moan through sleet and ash. Death places second, third, and fourth behind us. At home on the reservation, father sifts dried cedar leaves over glowing embers. Mother, hovering above cell phone light, awaits, he's okay, he never went out, watched a movie instead. But tonight, my speech has knives that quiver at the ellipses of neon Budweiser signs blinking through the fog windshield. And I text, I've only rescued a sliver of him. He's only 25 and he smells like blood and piss. His turquoise bracelet snatched for pawn by the same ghosts who, treated, who traded his jacket for a robe of snow and ice before inviting him back into the caravan for one more, just one more. Forget I'm middle aged now, so I gotta do this. It's like those words were disappearing on the page. They're dissolving on the page. Um, so I'll just read some selections from Dissolve. It's a book length poem, and uh, yeah, just kind of not, not much. Not much to really talk about um, in terms of what it's saying. I think uh, the, the introduction really captured what it, what I was trying to do with this book. Um, originally just seeing if a poem, ultimately seeing if a poem could fail. I know that's not really always what a, a poet uh, wants their work to do, you know, <laughs> but I was really interested in this sort of gesture and maybe it's a gesture of, um, you know, witnessing grief or, or, or being in grief, but not having a kind of exit or not having a kind of finality to it, just sort of watching it trickle away. Um, so, from the Zolve. <clears throat> On limbs of slanted light, painted with my mind's skin color, I step upon black braids, oil drenched, worming from last month's orphaned mouth. Winged with burning, I ferry them across, I ferry them from my filmed eyes, wheezing. Scalp blood in my footprints, my buckskin pouch filling with photographed sand. No language, but it's rhymed, crackling in the past tense. This poem pivots a walking cane, then sniffs vacuum-packed air strung from pawn shop windows. It climbs cloud hair only to fall back upon red soil, salt water masks sweating on our smeared faces. Unbelted from snow dusted fog, night stretching out longer than anticipated, abalones the waking that creaks when soaked in the blood of dragonflies. Hunched over the sleeping, this night wears a garden's dust cloud, cleaves body heat from a barometer with pine claws. Its head gaseous in hindsight grows a third shadow. Drifts, back, drifts past fog-rimmed children's whales, then licks dry, rain-moistened teeth, steaming in plastic bags. Hammering liquid night to the lake's final skeleton, our soft-toothed tailbones tingle in the mirror we changed our minds in. Strangers to our breath, we wheeze in dying trees, then take the shape of toothless mouths, suckling the driest months, the driest branches. Coaxed over barbed fence line, strummed into cricket chirp, this address wears a, fo a fog's yellow ankles toward the floor plan of a reservation spiraling back from the aftermath. Dust dappled mist in its craw, engine fluid, trailing its gullet. An elegy hands me a busy signal. Its handle broke me from my tooth. I chew its answers until I taste cracks in the chrome outline of a sky without hands. 
Notice every link in the trail to here is a bullet pa bullet's path to back there. The hue of off-color messages collapsed. What crows above a city's end dash doused in whale oil hangs here named nameless. Covering its sobs with corral dirt, I imagine a canyon floor, cornstalks growing in rows along a sunlit sandstone wall in the far corner of a room late in life. A field of moonlight, double parked in snow melt, absorbs coyote fur as it smokes through pincers disassembling heaving from breathing. Capped with nesting swallows, pollen clouds barb the waning moon's tapered gown to a crown of krill and sea foam. Amber clouds of bone marrow lathered over corn husk are crushed sideways into a toothache before waning daylight's tongue scent bleeds through a fly-papered horizon. <coughs> One year before last, I noticed a foot tied with horsehair in the shade of a cedar tree, horse milk dripping from a bull-whipped gavel near it. <coughs> I replace what I saw with what I heard, pull out a letter sent from ourself to myself, and for a second, the flattened field is chandeliered by desert animal constellations. This mountain stands near us, mountaining. It mistakes morning for morning when we wear slippers of steam to erase our carbon footprint. Wind's fingers wearing yours, you unravel a plow of harvested light. Notice its embers when scrubbed on drowned faces repel fossilized wind. The mind's wind unlaces hammering over pixelated heel bones clasped to the nerve endings of my fingers' ghosts. These hands locked in a hive of red ant swan through children grunting at the bank of one language while the other tethers moonlight to firelight. Their dark flitting unthreads this land from deveined searchlights, groping for embers in eyes that blur while blinking. How the map must look when black water is ladled from white water. When it's your face that ripples silver, not mule deer skipping across the creeks forgetting. How it might be then to look through silicone eyes, see a worm spigot maw dangling atop the periphery of an axe blade's slumber. <clears throat> to window the past, slide blurred eyes in, to door the future, steam open, ice-licked mice skulls, fling them against walls, whitewashed, until thinness surfaces cooing. A field that shivered with a thousand cranes evaporates in someone else's backyard. Gill sliced into the mountain's crests, resin hourly. Televised vapor muzzles a hummingbird's gassed lungs. A cliff line wavers under a table's august. Shears jangle in the corral's black and white photograph. Rented from a shepherd of doves, we return replenished with categories. We are husbands to raised hillsides, wives to drowned bridges. When interred in plexiglass, our origin salinated. Semicolons coughed out by the final raven sizzle the hand's parched memory. Demagnetized moans drizzle magnetic north. 
Unbelted, we plunge through our closed minds, open palmed. The blowing sand of our faces, tongues buried in the hovering, the hovering bird twice, and through the cage we swell, new teeth throbbing in our lungs. Bison bone sled crumbles where a century piled feathered torsos lit them on fire. Dog-eared in amnesia, questions spear what to why. Nodded to the gun's reflection, the storm unnodding, the new there thickening and thinning air. Dimmest below our downward gaze, these stars gazing back at us. How self-indulgent that moon always looking down. So I'll skip a little bit. Um, let me see. I'll just, uh, there's a the last part of this book. Um, I, I wrote when I visited um, Carlisle, uh, it's not even the military academy in, in Pennsylvania. My host, I read at a community college near there, and my host uh, gave me a ride early in the morning and to this site where, um, the former site of Carlisle Indian School, uh, where they took many of uh, uh, Native children to um, in the late uh, 19th century or mid 19th century. Um, I, I know it's, it's just something that I think all Natives have a kind of um, memory of or somebody knows about it. It's, it's kind of the, a very painful time and for many of these uh, young people. I could just imagine, you know, just all the different kids coming there. And, and, uh, and then we stopped by the road and um, he pointed out to a cemetery that was just right off the road there. And um, he told me, yeah, um, and then you notice these white marble uh, headstones, military-like headstones. On each, on each of these headstones is a name of uh, the tribe or the, uh, the tribe that this, this, this child was from. And uh, there was, it, was a, it was a fairly big, big, big plot. And um, they, uh, my, my host mentioned that uh, that graveyard used to be inside the grounds, but they wanted to move it. Um, they moved it out here, uh, relocated it out here um, because they wanted to build a soccer field inside the campus. And I just thought like, well, that's another kind of removal. There's removals within removals. But now I think a lot of those, um, those um, bodies are being taken home and being repatriated, which is a good thing. So this last part is, is sort of dealing with that. And also, I was a teacher. Um, I mean, I was doing a lot of like poetry in the schools um, towards the end of, um, before I started writing this, and I noticed that there were a lot of um, clusters of suicides, um, you know, group suicides happening on several reservations in the area that I come from. And I just thought, why are you know children doing this? <clears throat> so it's a little bit about that. A chopping blocks, cobalt hum, mothing birds of summer lightning, lulls a hatchet's handle loose to capsize children, aiming their flint spines toward steering wheels thawing in house fires. Suckled by shadows, suckling their feet, enrolled in a disappearing act. They hand stitch starless skies to their temporary faces. Their scraping is a smear facing another smear. Their sky's blue veins are horses neighing through them. Their dream of lightning dreams. The blurring heaves blue as it breathes out sacks of black hair. Their faces mountaining a lake's closed book. Glint smashed cairns sealed in lizard scales. Their, their past lays bright eggs when silent lathers drag nets over their mother's words for refrigerator light, moon rock, escape. See how they shiver even when their arms are shined to a hide loss. And the dawn light reveals their stone teeth glinting inside a tree's whimpering. 
Shifting shape, they pinch shut a keyhole's hung. Wait, shifting shape, they pinch shut the keyhole of a of hunger's toll booth. Then release chirping birds from their detachable wrists. We remember their footsteps moored in glass jars, but forget flattened huts spilling their scars over the renaming of past landslides. Their shouts flail from empty school chairs to blurry visions at closing time. The vowels of the starved hang over the sequel of them. They are what raven's claws would sound like when unzipped from fallen apples. Gathered in thirds of halves, they drain spotlights on police dogs barking at their floating cages. Firearms sliced with ladders, the climb downward climbs up to greet them. A phantom arm feeling wants them to return their feet. Falling from their cut hair, heart sounds sunlighting the hallway back to them. Will their torch names walk again as light water? Will they charge a fee to resharpen the horns of our dull speech? West of dying, they ask to sleep in each other's arms. Then unravel from buildings weaving upright where bayonets stab the sea for warmth. Their coiled shadows obsidian as they lace ribbons of cedar bark into black wind. Then stretch gauze wrap over gates swelling from razors glinting in their palms' heat. Their imagined tails bridled with spit-soaked ash striate liquid light where the dissection begins. Behind their mother's maced skulls, they push lantern-lit compasses into unmapped seasons, wing wind with red skin. Their viscous tails thaw our tongue's coastlines as when they strap dawn's first glint to a weather of creaking chairs so black boots won't be captured on cameras sniffing their bruised masks. Stained glass splinters in their creased mouths, their fists among mirrors growling inside other fists. Pixelating through sorrel skin, they silhouette teeth, nailing thick mud to thin mud, and sing our horses to sleep on. Their back, their bark blankets to incubate light bulbs flickering in egg cartons. They inhale the pond's shadow while kneeing our shoulders to roan scent. An overcast of them, scraped from the water's footsteps, cinder the bull's damp chest. Absorbing liquid night through gilled feet, they cackle from sand domes, sand dunes, silver teeth twitching in their beaks. Moans sip from dilated pupils. The seizures bid them to stay. The elevator door shuts for the year when they press their palms flat against the fogged rim of the reservation. No sound steals past their squawking. Reaching into their buckskin pouches, they finger the patter of feet loosened. Foreheads torch-lit, they drift above hornet clouds, notice heaving under a corona of rearranged stars. The people wagering for more, more. They pronoun Donning's expiration date with singed macaw feathers. Suddenly, they were this close, this far. This hour, not the ridge of, not their jumping off point. The sea drinking through them, here's the unraveling also. The, the scraping of a train engine nearing childhood whimper whimpers under them. What lies beneath naming, they curl outward with wool scent. Still, a noose glimmers above the orphaning field. They forget to forget they were ours only during the itching. <clears throat> so that's from here. And uh, I'll read you some new work. Um, more during the pandemic. I mean, yeah, no, yeah, the pandemic. <laughs> Jeez, is it still the pandemic? Uh, uh, there was so much loss on, in, in my community. And this is my new manuscript. It's all like I carry when I when I'm when I'm almost like at 
completion, I carry my manuscript everywhere with me. So I don't know. Sometimes I pull it out, read it. Uh, but the new book is called uh, The Next Sky, and it sort of takes place afterwards. Um, a lot of times in, in my books, there's a figure that is always sort of in the background, uh, often wearing a mask, uh, this figure. So finally, the figure, I feel like, in the new book is uh, speaking you know, directly. And they feel like, it feels like a kind of portrait of this person. But uh, also during the pandemic, I wrote um, uh, narr more narrative pieces. Uh, I started writing a memoir um, of the situation. I don't know if it's a memoir, but I just started writing memories. Um, and Lucy Tapahanzo, who's an Navajo poet, often um, says that she writes uh, from, she finds a poem in her memory and uh, somewhere. And to locate that poetic moment, she writes from that. And um, my mother was working uh, for the senior center, and she's delivering food. And of course, I'm scared for her. Um, and she, she had this long driving a white bus uh, or white van, delivering food to the elders who can't come to gather at the senior center. Um, and you know, just her talking to her every week or the other week, and somebody else dies, and somebody else dies. And eventually, she's like, oh, no, you know, so many people on my route passed away you know, during that time. Um, but I started looking, I guess I wanted to bring some of that back because I grew up in a really, in a traditional family, in a traditional um, environment up till I was, um, and I spoke, I speak Navajo, I'm a, I'm a rather fluent speaker and uh, just grew up in a traditional life. My grandfather was a medicine man and, uh, you know, I got to experience a lot of that when I was growing up. So this piece is called Amma. Uh, this isn't, uh, this is part of the next sky, but Amma means mother, and I know like in many languages, Ma, Amma is like mother, uh, but in our language, it's um, uh, Shema would be my mom, Ibama would be somebody else's mother, mine, I mean, then I decided to call it Amma. A little portrait of my mother, you know, bathing her son, I don't know who that guy is, but, um, you know. and, and back in the, uh, when, when I was a kid, we didn't, have running water in my, and, and so I just remember bathing in a, on, a, on a table, being bathed on a table, and our light was a kerosene, uh, sort of like camp light that, that she would light up every night. Emma. Soap suds lace mother's hands as she slides her naked son into the plastic tub's green hold. A raft run around, run aground on the kitchen table. His eyelashes woven taut against the sting. A wash rag arcing his glistening brown back. Oil black slick hair pressed flat. The kerosene lantern's white sigh. All adrift in her wind rattled single wide. I forget how to read on paper. Oh, I guess I just wrote from, read from a book. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, when I was also growing up, it was kind of interesting. I kind of had this memory of, of uh, you know, times of, of, of drought and times, and it's always been in drought. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, if you threw me in the water, uh, I'll probably just um, you know, say my last wave at you guys and just kind of go down. <laughs> But uh, notice that you know I, I come from the desert, and I, I, um, and so th this is a, a part where um, when we were kids, we were not allowed to play with the water or waste water, um, and only when it got really extreme and there was no no weather, did uh, were, were we given permission to play at the water, play with the water. So we had these water fights, called them water fights. Um, so this is called, uh, uh, again, another memory. Uh, 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 is the West. He leans on his elbow, looks West. As parents out there wait for his sister's headlamps to arc across their bedroom wall. He recalls his grandmother snapping her cane skyward, accusing 
airplanes of cutting rain clouds in half. Then remembers his reservation childhood, his chest lettered with trough water, all his cousin's shirts wet and loosened, slick white clay sticking to their tribal shoes. How their young bodies annoyed the gods as they shouted about chasing grandmothers, aunts, and uncles with buckets and cups. Air woven by their laughter right before they gasped at storm clouds gathering and darkening the western horizon. So I always thought it was like interesting that kids had the power to bring rain or play. Play had the power to bring rain. <clears throat> Uh, this is called a kiss, and a kiss means friend. And um, my grandfather uh, passed away in the, in '98. Um, again, he was a medicine man, and and a medicine man is a shaman, I suppose, or just a um, person who heals through uh, song and uh, ceremony and ritual. And um, you know, I, towards the end of his life, I I went to community college and I left and. I um, just kind of drove him around, hung out with him, you know, stayed with uh, him and my grandmother for a couple of years. And uh, just drive him, we would drive him to different ceremonial sites, or I would drive him. Um, not, I'm not a good driver, but you didn't want him driving either. <laughs> You'd rather have me driving. Um, so I used to drive him, and we used to go to uh, Canyon, Kim's Canyon on the Hopi Reservation. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Hopi Reservation is so different. Um, in, in terms, not the reservation itself, but just in terms of um, culture and language. Um, and there are neighbors, and, uh, you know, so much has been said, like when I was growing up in the 80s, about the Navajo land dispute. But um, I was f found friendship there. And, uh, and one time my cousin and I were um, invited to one of the the happenings up there, kind of dance that was going on up there. So this starts off with that. A kiss. <clears throat> oh, and then um, my grandfather also had like a, a friend that he would always talk to outside his trading post. And, you know, I'd be sitting in the car. I'd be like, come on, bro, let's go. You know, we have to, I don't want, you guys can talk later or whatever. Um, but they would be kind of talking with their hands, you know, sign language. And... Um, I was I, I never really thought about it, but I thought, oh, that's now that I think about it, that's probably the way they were communicating because they didn't speak each other's languages, um, you know. So, th the guy spoke the the friend spoke Hopi and that and English, and my grandfather only spoke Navajo. So they were having a whole conversation about their zucchinis or something. <laughs> a kiss. Strangers in this Mesa Top village, my cousin and I dash for the car. From a small brick house, a voice, you Navajos look lost, come in, eat. Ladling mutton, squash, and bean soup into our bowls, the man asks, where are you from? Which family? Mutton gristle softening between teeth. I find out long ago my grandfather hauled spring water up the mesa for this man's family. In the window, light-wrapped silhouettes on rooftops, dancers shifting and chanting below them. The man asks if we want more, bellies full, we decline, shake his hand. On the walk to the car, chants rumble behind us. Driving back down the mesa, I wonder who my father, who my grandfather befriended here. If he had family, old friends, perhaps a lover. I think of the many times my grandfather and an old Hopi farmer carved shapes of corn, squash, rain or no rain, with their brown fingers, rolling and cupping the whites of their palms in the shade of Kimis Canyon trading posts the language between them planted at another time.
<clears throat> I'll just give you a little glimpse of what's happening in my new book, The Next Sky. <laughs> Thank you so much. Looking in from the next world, eyes still coated with cold dust, we seal black the past. In this unveiling, a rain-stabbed blackbird's obsidian sigh rises from meat fragrant slits in our speech patterns. Where a way of seeing home smeared on elbow, smeared on walls with elbow blood, is also a way of nozzling birdcaw to thieved land. Or scissoring fog-lobed nightfall into crescent moons, while it bells the oxygenated moan, weeping for its lost reflection is hauled away on a horse-drawn hearse. Here, ghost hands crackle beneath a flint blade's jagged spike. Here also, a windstorm's bellow, cracking open thoughts of crow beaks, pinned to smog, bridging a canyon rim to its midnight shadow. And there, under the next sky, hunger-bellied drought unlocks doors, wiped clear of the names, of seasons skinned from tire treads. Lured by the solid dark to drag sentences toward closer, I look for the song that held my hand, not the ghost who spit into my eyes and pierced my eye, and spit into my mouth and pierced my eyes with rain-scented fingernails. The smoke in the valley, I imagine, is my umbilical cord. But that, too, spirals away from the twisting plot's thinness. Sometimes I think pills can bring back the earth photographed in black and white, bring back seasons that visit when summoned by waving cornstalks over fire. Cinder smoke curls from, from thorn... Wait, cinder smoke curls thorn-tipped out of my throat. Moonlight heats minutes to hours as I thrum from inside where a crack begins to widen. You go in there, just a little, little, little teaser. Um, hopefully I'll send it off soon. Thank you so much again, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a break. <laughs> We're just going to take a quick five minute break to do tech setup before starting the craft talk at two. If you need to go, um, please check out the books and the broadsides on the table before you leave, and they'll be here after the talk as well. <laughs> 